The UFC is the premier promotion for mixed martial arts, and there is no name more synonymous with the brand than Dana White. He serves as the president and even owns a minority stake in the company. Under his leadership, the UFC has grown into a juggernaut set to rival other leagues in the world of professional sports. But things haven't always been so rosy for Dana and the UFC. In this video, we'll look at how Dana White rose to prominence alongside the ascension of the Ultimate Fighting Championship. Dana White was born in Manchester, Connecticut in 1969. During his childhood, his family would move around a bit going from Boston to Las Vegas for a little while, but primarily residing in Boston. He would pick up boxing at the age of 17 and immediately fell in love with the sport. After he graduated from high school, Dana would try his hand at college but would ultimately drop out twice from two different schools. Instead, he began working a series of jobs. He paved roads for a little while, became a bouncer, a bellman, and even a valet at a high-end hotel. While working at the hotel, Dana and his co-workers would get into arguments about who was owed what amount of the tips left by the wealthy guests. As a way to settle the dispute, Dana and his colleagues would go into the basement of the hotel and fight it out. These basement brawls didn't allow any headshots or shots to the groin, but everything else was fair. Whoever won the fight got to keep the tips. By the age of 19, Dana knew he wanted to do something in the fight business. He felt that even though his current job at the hotel paid him well, he wasn't going to be fulfilled unless he found a way to make the world of fighting a part of his everyday life. After Dana had this revelation, he quit his job as a valet and started teaching boxing classes in the basement of his local courthouse. In these classes, Dana would train kids how to box as a way for them to gain respect for the sport and more importantly, for one another. Dana wouldn't charge these kids, so he began recruiting paying clients like businessmen and housewives to come train with him as a form of exercise and to become active. Dana took the initial success from his basement and went to local gyms in Boston to hold his training classes. This move proved to be very successful for Dana as his class sizes became larger. At the age of 21, Dana would be jumped by a group of men at a bar where he would be beaten for about 20 minutes. By the end, Dana was on one knee due to being tired and weakened of the fight when one of the attackers would end up striking Dana in the left ear repeatedly. During the days that followed, Dana's ears would be ringing constantly and upon our doctor's visit, he found out he had suffered permanent hearing loss and extensive ear damage. He would be diagnosed with Meniere's disease which would be compounded with dizziness and vertigo. Dana's bad luck would continue when during one of his boxing classes, a notable associate of the notorious Winter Hill Gang, Kevin Weeks, walked in and demanded $2,500. Dana would ignore the request and continued about his business, until one day, he would receive an unexpected phone call from the gang demanding him to pay the $2,500, giving him until 1pm of the next day to come up with the amount. Understanding that he had neither the money nor the curiosity to find out what would await him the next day, Dana packed his bags and was on a flight to Las Vegas just hours later. In Las Vegas, Dana would continue to work in the world of boxing, either training or managing fighters. Dana would also create an apparel brand targeted at boxers known as Bull and Bicer, named after the dog breed. The apparel would be worn by Floyd Mayweather when he was first starting his professional career, but later he replaced it with more notable and popular brands. Dana would eventually reunite with an old childhood friend of his back when he first used to live in Las Vegas, Lorenzo Fertitta, who at the time was on the State Athletic Commission and also running a chain of casinos alongside his brother Frank. The three of them reconnected and planned to pursue business opportunities in boxing. However, on one night, Dana and Frank would be hanging out at the Hard Rock Casino when they spotted John Lewis, a well-respected martial artist that Dana happened to know. Frank said that he wanted to learn how to fight on the ground, and Dana mentioned to learning too as well. They both walked over to talk to John and through a brief conversation with him, set up a private lesson where both the Fertitta brothers and Dana would learn jiu-jitsu. Upon their first lesson, they would immediately fall in love with the sport and began taking more and more lessons. Through John Lewis, Dana would be introduced to others in martial arts, and he was amazed at how the fighters were not only great athletes, but also incredibly smart. Dana and the Fertitta brothers would then begin attending live UFC shows. Every time Dana would attend one of these shows, he would think to himself about all the things that the current owners could have been doing better with the execution of the show and the brand. Dana would eventually leave the boxing industry and began managing mixed martial artists like Tito Ortiz and Chuck Liddell, who were both employed by the UFC. Dana would soon get into a dispute with then UFC management 
about Tito's contract. During the dispute, Dana was able to gain insight on the company's financials and came to find out that the UFC may be about to go bankrupt. He wondered if they would be open to selling the company and the brand. Dana called the Fertitta brothers and urged them to consider purchasing the failing brand as he felt he had a clear vision on how to make it a success. The brothers were intrigued with the idea, but their father was against the purchase of the company as he thought it was bad for their personal and professional reputation. At the time, the UFC operated under very loose rules and non-existent regulations from athletic commissions. Punches to the groin, headbutting, and a hair pulling were some of the legal but dirty tactics allowed in a fight. Human cockfighting was one of the labels that became synonymous with the early version of the brand, which was coined by then-Senator John McCain. Despite their father's protest, the Fertitta brothers decided to go ahead and continue considering the purchase of the UFC. Lorenzo would cold call the owner and express his intent on purchasing the company. During negotiations that lasted about a month, the owner revealed he wanted $1 million for 50% of the company. Lorenzo countered the offer with the option to instead buy 100% of the UFC for $2 million. Both sides agreed to the offer in late 2001, and the UFC was now under new management. In the deal, the Fertitta brothers would maintain 90% of the ownership, while Dana would receive 10% and he would serve as the president. The new owners only received the brand name and an old wooden octagon ring. The previous owner had sold off almost everything, including the media rights, merchandising rights, and even the website domain. At the time, UFC.com stood for User Friendly Computers. Immediately after taking ownership, Dana would begin work on rebuilding and revamping the brand, starting off with buying back all the rights that the previous owner had sold off. He worked alongside athletic commissions to establish rules and regulations for the sport so it could shed its reputation for being a barbaric display of combat. One of the main problems that he ran into was in his search for sponsors. Advertising accounts for a good chunk of revenue for any sport, and at the time, nobody wanted to associate themselves with the UFC. Nobody would return Dana's calls, and just altogether they wanted no ties with the brand. Dana would hound executives for a meeting, sometimes flying to their offices and waiting outside to talk with them as they left. On one instance, he followed a pay-per-view executive by finding out what conference he was going to be at and waited outside to pitch to him. Dana kept persisting and kept tracking this man down to pitch to him over and over again about the UFC. In Dana's own words, he terrorized the executive. Ultimately, the executive gave Dana and the UFC their first pay-per-view deal. Getting on pay-per-view was not the only challenge the UFC faced, as it could also not find venues to house the fights. Donald Trump would give the UFC a shot by allowing them to host their first two shows at his casino, the Taj Mahal. Trump would show up himself and actively support the UFC. The Fertitta brothers and Dana were under the assumption that some of the glaring mistakes about the UFC was that it was not on pay-per-view, nor was it sanctioned in most states. After they got on pay-per-view and sanctioned in Nevada, they realized that the UFC had not become magically profitable as they had once thought it would. They would still have to spend tons of money to market the brand and come up with numerous strategies to help get the UFC much larger exposure. Their efforts would lead them into over $40 million in debt. The UFC was actually losing money on every show that they put on, despite the slowly rising audience. The Fertitas had just about reached the end of their patience with trying to make the UFC become a viable business. They would soon ask Dana to look around to possibly sell the brand as they were ready to accept the loss and get on with their lives. Dana would ask around to see who would be willing to purchase the UFC. He received interest from a fight manager in Florida who offered $5 to $7 million for the company. Dana reported this back to Lorenzo, who said to hold off on answering the offer as he wanted to think about it. Lorenzo would have a change of heart and told Dana that he was not ready to sell and that he was determined to make the UFC successful. Pay-per-view has a limited amount of revenue potential for a company the size of the UFC at the time as it was still relatively unknown and only hardcore fans of the brand would be following the promotion. The UFC realized that they needed more exposure and that they needed to be more accessible to people outside of the hardcore fan base if they wanted to become successful. So they came up with a reality television show concept called The Ultimate Fighter. In the show, fighters compete against each other in the hopes of obtaining a six-figure contract at the UFC. They would pitch the show to numerous cable networks, but once again met opposition from everyone. After pitching to everyone, an associate of Lorenzo's would advise him to have the UFC produce the show themselves and have another network air it for them. They took this idea to Spike TV and they agreed to air the show, contingent on the UFC being able to sell the advertising slots during the programming. They were unable to sell a single one of their commercial slots, so they instead filled them with promos for the pay-per-view fight that would occur at the end of the show's season. Despite all the trouble that went towards getting on television, the UFC's efforts were vindicated when the show turned out to be a hit, with the first episode alone obtaining over 1 million viewers. 
This was only the beginning as the show would consistently grow every episode as the season progressed. The first season of The Ultimate Fighter concluded with the electric fight, Forrest Griffin vs. Steven Bonner. This was the first live UFC event that was free to see on cable TV. Anybody could tune in and watch it. As the fight progressed that night, the TV viewership kept growing. The fight was brutal but hard fought and the audience at the event and those watching at home were excited by what they were witnessing. By the end of the night, Dana would reward both fighters the six-figure contract. The event would drive new fans into the UFC in droves and would make sports news headlines. In his own words, Dana has said that it was the most important fight in UFC history. Spike TV would realize the success of The Ultimate Fighter after that fight and quickly offered to buy the second season that night. They met behind the arena and on a napkin, they negotiated and finalized the terms of the deal. Advertisers finally began responding and interest from the sponsors began rising as they also realized the potential of the UFC. The Ultimate Fighter would spark the turnaround of the UFC's fortunes and it finally gave Dana and the Fertitta brothers hope that the UFC could become a successful and profitable business. In 2007, the UFC would acquire their largest rival at the time, Japan-based Pride Fighting Championship for $70 million. By 2011, they had acquired another large competitor, Strike Force. Fighters like Ronda Rousey, Daniel Cormier, Robbie Lawler, and Mark Hunt were just some of the talented fighters that fought at these promotions. Through these deals, the UFC would gain access to past fight libraries and fighter contracts, allowing them to integrate them into the UFC. Both acquisitions cemented the UFC as the undisputed promotion in mixed martial arts. Later in 2011, UFC signed an agreement with Fox Sports for seven years, thus ending their relationship with Spike TV. The deal would bring the UFC a $100 million every year from broadcast rights alone. This new relationship would further bring the brand into mainstream consciousness and give the UFC legitimacy among other professional sports. In early 2016, New York became the 50th and final state to allow MMA events to take place since the initial ban took place in 1997. UFC 205 would be the first event held in New York with the headline fight of Conor McGregor versus Eddie Alvarez. A few months after the New York sanctioning of MMA, the UFC would be sold for an unprecedented $4.2 billion. This would mark the largest transaction ever in the history of professional sports. The sale would make the Fertitta brothers billionaires and Dana White hundreds of millions of dollars. Dana would be kept on as the president of the company while still helping the UFC ascend to new heights. In 2018, the UFC reached an exclusive deal with ESPN to showcase their fights and provide access to the UFC library. The five-year deal is worth $1.5 billion, adding a consistent stream of revenue each year. In 2019, the UFC would open their state-of-the-art Apex Training and Production Facility near their Las Vegas headquarters. This new arena would accommodate live fights and other entertainment events. Just a year later, during the national lockdown caused by the pandemic, the UFC became the first sport back due to the infrastructure in place at the Apex facility. Dana would later announce the purchase of 10 acres of land to add to the Apex facility to undergo construction of the proposed UFC hotel. This new addition would make the UFC become further self-sufficient by providing fighter, staff, and special guest housing. The UFC, in its modern form, can be attributed to the vision of three individuals. Where others saw the impossible and most likely failure, Dana White and the Fertitta brothers saw opportunity. They achieved incredible success by bringing martial arts into mainstream appeal. They provided a platform for different personalities to showcase their martial arts skills against each other and along the way inspired an entirely new generation to take up MMA. The organization has become a household name and the history of mixed martial arts is forever intertwined with the ultimate fighting championship. It's that I was going to be in the business, that I was going to be in the fight business, one way or another. It's just, it's what my passion was.